Feel session to increase your faith, to cause you to walk in the steps that are ordered of the Lord instead of the steps that men order for you. But God's steps for us is supernatural, presence and the power that resides in his design for us is to always carry us above the ordinary. So we bless you this morning for joining us. May the same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead may manifest himself in your circumstances today. In Jesus' name, hallelujah. Well, you guys take your seats, please. In honor of the Lord, say amen. God is always good, is he not? I would that you would go with me to Psalms 105 this morning as we start. We're talking about having a supernatural walk with God today. If you guys don't mind. It's nothing like walking with him for... He's more accurate about your situations than you ever will be. And when we walk with him, we know we're going to get to wherever we're going successful. But we're also going to get there with the benefits of having his presence with us. In Psalms 105, you guys get there? Yes, somebody can say amen. Amen, amen and amen. All right. Pastor Milton? Oh, the great pastor that you are. I always call him my hero. My man. <laughs> Would you please step over there? And I know you have the strength of He-Man. Bring me that stone over there. Amen. In Psalms 105, now again, we're going to take a supernatural walk today because the world is trying to get you to be so natural that you forget all about who you really are. Think you can hold that for just a second there? My man. <laughs> Weighs a little bit, doesn't it? Just a little bit, a little bit. I'm not gonna keep you here long. In Psalms 105, you guys there? Yeah. All right. There's a picture given to us about Israel's walk with God when they came out of Egypt. And again, when you're walking with God, it's not a natural walk. It's a supernatural walk because I'm walking with the Lord. Now, some people, they believe that, you know, I can walk by myself and be myself and do everything I want. Well, that's always been Satan's uh, uh, modification of everything to steal, kill, and destroy your life uh, because he's just always wanted to make you uh, always substitute something for the Word of God. No matter what it is, it can be a person, it can be a business, it can be food, whatever it is, he's always tried to get men to substitute something for the word of God. Okay, that's what he did with Eve in the garden, substitute the wealth of that tree for the word that God has given you. Let's substitute that. And he's always did that. He's, he does it with you. He's doing it with some of you right now, you know. And so what we want to know today is how they walked and what caused them to fail? That their walk did not continue. But you and I have a walk with Jesus now. Somebody said, thank God for yeah. Jesus. <laughs> All right? And we need to know that this is a supernatural walk. See, everything about you as a believer is supernatural. But the world tries to teach you how to live the way the world lives. All right? You need to sit down while you're holding out. Hold on, you got it. All right. My man. All right. And so in Psalms, <laughs> Psalms 105, it says this. Egypt was glad when they departed. Verse 38. Egypt was glad. Some of your friends are glad when you get away from them. I can tell you that. All right. And some of those old bondages that you had that had you, they were glad you left too because they were struggling to hold you. You guys don't... Don't you know that when you get free, that thing that had you, it's glad you're gone because it's got to fight God. It's in a struggle with Almighty God. 
It's glad that you put that bottle down and gone because it's going like, oh, praise the Lord. He finally got free. Get out of here. Because as long as you are struggling, guess what? You're struggling with that thing too. That thing is all the power that's bringing you to free you is also against that thing that's holding you. See, you know, I told my wife years ago, I said, don't people glad we're gone, baby. I said, because every, every time you present yourself in a place where something has you in bondage or is holding you, that thing has to struggle about your presence. All right? And unless you give in to it, it's glad that you're gone. Somebody say amen. amen. Say, we're going to can that. We're going to take that home, put it on the shelf. We're going to ask the Holy Spirit to give us some more light on it. And then we're going to know what you know, Pastor. All right, all right. Now let's get back to the subject. Each of was glad when they departed. For the fear of them fell upon them. He spread a cloud for a covering and fire to give them give light in the night. And the people asked, and he brought quails and satisfied them with the bread of heaven. This is a supernatural walk. And he opened the rock. And water gushed out. And, ran, and they ran in the dry places like a river, for he remembered his holy promise and Abraham his servant. I want to ask all of you guys this morning. My man is holding a rock. Can you pick that up and let all of them see? And let's get a picture of this. This is a small rock. All right? I put some big ones at the gate yesterday. So if you guys got a knack of backing up up there and backing over top of our flowers, <laughs> you're going to remember the rock. Because <laughs> it's there now. All right? All right? You're going to remember that, Okay? Because I see people up there back all over top of our flowers. It's the most, I mean, what is, what is the people's problem today? Pull in and back over top of our flowers to turn around, to go nowhere. You know, I'm going like, you're not, go where are you going? And so I fixed that problem yesterday. <laughs> Can you hold that up for us, sir? I want to ask you guys something. It says that God opened up a rock. and pulled water out of the rock. And it says that water fed everybody and everything that was there. And, it's, and you can read this over in Exodus chapter 17, where the Lord told Moses, he says, I want you to go before the people because the people were complaining. They're in a supernatural walk. Have you ever complained in your supernatural walk? Tell the truth. Yes, you have. Right? And the Lord told Moses, he says, go before the people, take some of the elders, and he says, and I'm going to go and I'm going to stand on top of that rock. And he says, and I want you to speak to that rock. And when you speak to that rock, guess what? When he spoke to that rock, it says that rock opened up. But can you imagine those, those ones who were standing close seeing a rock open up? And then water began to come out of that rock and begin to, to take care of the thirst that was over the whole place that they were, they were, they were crying about. What, 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 what's the wonderful lesson in seeing the power of God open up a rock? Well, let's put you in the desert so you can get your own revelation. If you're in the desert, all you see is sand. Maybe a rock every now and then or cropping of a rock every now and then. You know, we're not talking about you at the oasis. We're talking about you in the desert. Okay? Anybody ever been in the desert? It's a dry place. Feel like, guess what? The heat's on you. You've been there, right? And, and in the desert, it says that they were walking around in the desert and their minds, because they have come out of slavery, their minds were only conducive to their senses, what they could see. And all they saw was sand. All they saw was everything is just you're dried up and everything is just, you know, it's just, there's no life here. And yet God says, I can give you, what you lift that down for? My bad. He gave you back up. <laughs> My man. <laughs> it says, I know he's getting tired. 
I need, I need, I need uh, her and her. What's in there? Ben her and her. her. <laughs> ben and her. Ben and her. Aaron and her. It says that they saw no place where they could expect a miracle. Looking at a rock. I got it. I got it. Looking at a rock. You can take your seat now. Thank you for your Wheaties. Looking at a rock. And you're thirsty. You don't expect anything from a rock. I'm going to go to this side because I think y'all got it. Looking at a rock, you would not expect that this is the place for your blessing. Looking at a rock, you would not expect that water is going to come from this to take care of your thirst. Now, I don't care how faithful you are today. All right? Y'all can talk all that faith stuff you want to talk and say, I'm this and that, and I'm glad you are. But if you were in the place where they were, and all they saw was sand, and all they saw were rocks, you would have no expectation of saying that any resource is coming to you. And you would have the same mind that they would have. You'd be grumbling and complaining. You shaking your head like ducks right now. But you'd be grumbling and complaining just like they were because looking at a rock and looking at sand, you would say there is no place that we could expect to get a glass of water. My kids are going to die of thirst. The flocks that we bought out of Egypt, they're going to die. The plants that we bought, they're going to dry up. There's no help looking at a rock. And this is why you got to get your eyes off of looking at things and always look at God. Because if you start looking at your circumstances, you are not going to look at God and expect miracles. You're going to always be going like, man, I tell you, is Uncle so-and-so got enough I can borrow from him? Oh, you know, can I get it from here? Can I go to this place? No, 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 no. See, you got to learn that God will bring your miracle through an unexpected thing. See, an unexpected, somebody say unexpected. God will bring your miracle through an unexpected resource. See, because we got a whole lot of self-resources. Come on, talk with me. We got a whole lot of resources that we go like, oh, well, I can go over there and borrow that for so-and-so. Well, I can pay them back. Well, I can work a little longer. Well, I can get a raise. I can do this. I can do it. Yeah, all those things are good. All those things are fine. But I'm going to tell you right now, when you get in the desert and you look around and all those resources gone, who are you going to depend on then? And this is why it's so important that we learn how to trust God. What God says is more accurate about your circumstance than what you think. All right? You will call yourself a woman being a man. Well, I'm a man. You are not a man as a woman. You were born by the design of God. He brought you here with his design purpose in you. Now, the enemy may have gotten in there somewhere and perverted some things, but let me tell you something. When you stand in front of the mirror, you're still a woman. And that can't be perverted. You can't pervert the mirror. <laughs> See, you can pervert a mind. Come on, talk with me. You can pervert a mind, but you can't pervert the mirror. Because the mirror is always going to tell you exactly this is the way it is. All right? And you can pervert a mind, but you cannot pervert a mirror. And so when you look in the word of God, the mirror of God's word, the eyes of God's word, they always tell you who you are. No doubt, because truth is always truth. Can you catch this? No, no, no. <laughs> All right. Well, 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 well. Did you guys get that? Always expect the unexpected. Well, my man, would you bring me all those buckets over there, sir? My lady, would you give me that bottle of oil up there? Y'all hang with me. Because the world teaches you like this every day with pictures. All right? Oh, 
Set him over there on the floor, sir. Thank you, Wayne. All right, here we go. Oh, just take them all out and just put Yeah, put them all on the steps. In fact, you can put them up on the high steps. We stepping high today, right? Amen. All right, we stepping high today. Y'all don't mind, because we are going to take this spiritual walk. And this walk is most important. See, because when I say 16, when I say 1,680 more, let me explain something to you guys. God told us that he'd give us double for our trouble. Amen. And double for your trouble is a reward. Hallelujah. Is it not? Yes. That's a reward, right? Okay, remember Job? God gave him twice as much as he had before. All right? And the twice as much came by what kind of resources? Unexpected. <laughs> unexpected resources. All right? Hey, they came by unexpected resources. And what you've got to understand is that, yes, sir, my man. is that reward is chosen by God. See, you know nothing about the individuals. They are handpicked by God because it's God's reward to you. And he ain't gonna give you no trash. See, when God rewards you, the Bible says that the blessing of the Lord maketh rich and addeth no sorrow to it. All right. So when the double for our trouble manifests fully, you're going to see people that God handpicked to be here. See, you got to get this thing. It's more than just a number to us. See, it's, it's a fulfillment of God's blessing. He gave this house that people might come and worship him in spirit and in truth and grow up and learn about him. And God's bringing worshipers here. All right. People that don't mind saying hallelujah. People that don't mind praising the Lord God and forget all about what your clock said because your clock could stop. But your praise should never stop. That, that, little, that little bunny, he goes, he goes, you know, he gonna slow down after a while, you know, and then he's going he's gonna to phase out. But your voice, your voice, your voice, your voice should never slow up. I don't care if you're going through the storm and the hailstorms. The hailstones are beating holes through your umbrella. You keep on praising God. Because let me tell you something. God's going to stop the storm in a little bit. It's going to run out. Because you're his child. And you got to understand who you are. See, you and I are walking in a supernatural walk. This is it's nothing natural about this. And the more we are conscious of who God is and who we are to him, the more consciousness we have of he's always with us. He'll never leave us nor forsake us. No matter what comes against you, no matter who says this or that, let me tell you something, God's got your back. And if you'll say what he says, he'll give you a word in your mouth that will pull down kingdoms, it will uproot things, it will build up, it will plant, it will make things happen for you. But you got to be able to hear him and all that noise out there is going on. You know? Well, you need to do this. No, I don't. First thing I need to do is listen to God. All right? I don't need to hear all that stuff out there. Everybody out there has got an opinion. It's like a nose. Everybody got one. Everybody's got an opinion. You know? But what does God know about your circumstance? You guys with me? Come on, go with me to 2 Kings real quick. We are in a supernatural walk. And we need to know and understand how powerful that walk is. Second Kings, hey, hey. Chapter four. God will bring you what you need in a way that you don't even expect. <laughs> Woo. Mercy. See, I'm expecting somebody to call and say, I saw you in that magazine. And I heard that somebody promised you that there were people just like me that had the ability to pay for anything you built. And so I just want you to know that uh, I'm one of those people they were telling you about. And so I, I need to have some figures. 
I'm not going to say, well, uh, you know, who are you? That may be in the conversation, but that ain't going to be my intention. I'm going to ask the person, what kind of resources do you have? Since you're talking to me about resources. Because ain't no sense talking to me about other stuff if you call me and tell me about resources, but you ain't got none. Because I, I got a whole lot of people that ain't got no resources. <laughs> I want to know if you got the resources. And if you got the resources, now how can we loose them? Okay? Not borrow them, loose them. Okay? And so, you know, I'm expecting a whole lot because, see, I didn't ask for anything but I'm getting a whole lot handed to me. And see, when God's handing you something that you didn't ask for, you got to understand, well, how can I use this to bring glory to God? See, I'm not interested in a whole lot of stuff that other people are interested in. I'm interested in you growing up, having a heart that loves God so much that no matter what comes against you, you're going to be able to stand up and say, just like in the book of Habakkuk, he said, even though the fields do not grow, and even though the olive plant does not flourish, and even though this don't happen and it don't rain, I am not going to forsake Almighty God. Yeah. See, you got to have that kind of mindset with God because God already owns everything. He already knows everything. So guess what? You're right in that place where he can bless you because the greater always blesses the lesser. Yes. Somebody says, sound like you're talking about me, Pastor. Yes. Second Kings, you guys with me? Yes. We're talking about walking in the supernatural, not the old natural stuff. See, you can get your raises and your, your positions and you can get new businesses and you can have kids, and you can have, I've seen all kinds of stuff here in this ministry. There are grown-ups walking around today that are 20-some years old, I'm sure, by now. The doctors told their parents, don't have any kids. You can't have any children. I was in their room when she told after the first one, don't have any more kids because you, your body just can't handle it. And the girl had another one. See, I know God wants us to live like that. Because those are the things that can help people to understand. I got to get out of this place and get over here to that place. Because I'm tired of being sick. You know anybody tired of being sick? <laughs> Set you free, Jesus will. It says this. You guys ought to be there by now. All right. Chapter 4, verse 1. Now there cried a certain woman, I'm glad she was certain, of the wives of the sons of the prophet unto Elisha, saying, Thy servant, my husband, he's dead. And, and thou knowest that my, thy servant did fear the Lord. And the creditor has come to take unto him my two sons to be bondmen. This was the law. You didn't pay your bills, they come get your kids. Till your kids paid the bill. <laughs> you guys with me? If that was the case today, we wouldn't have any kids around us. <laughs> You know, <laughs> if, that was, if that was the case, man, today, most, and most people, not, not everybody, you know, not everybody, but if that was the case, you know, you, see, you wouldn't see your kids say they were grown people paying off your student loans. I got student loans. I got 90000 over here. My wife got 400000 over there because she stayed in school two months longer than I did, so they, they doubled hers. And they said, okay, we're coming to get your kids. Not my baby. Yes, your baby. By law, I can take your baby. He old enough to work. Guess what? He's coming to work for me. Pay your bill off. Next time you see your kid, you know, your kid comes to the nursing home to see you. Because they, li they lived their whole life paying off your debt. That's just the law. That was the way the law was. They lived, you know. Thank God they had the jubilee. Said everything was free and they went back home because if they we don't have no jubilee. Your kids would be there forever. <laughs> Let's get back to this. <laughs> Woo! He says, uh, Elisha said unto her, What shall I do for thee? What do you want me to do? All right? I'm glad she came to the right man. What do you want me to do for you? Tell me what do you have in your house? Because, see, God's always looking for a seed. See, seed faith is always about taking something that you have and giving it into something that God wants you to, into instruction so that you can get what you want. Okay? That's what seed faith is always about. So he asked me, what, what do you have in your house? 
And she said, thine handmaiden have nothing in the house but a pot of oil. And he says, that's enough. Because anything that's small to you can become big with God. Remember the loaves and the fish? How are you going to feed 5,000 hungry mouths with a few loaves of bread and a few fish? You know? And he said, now check out the instructions. I want you to go. And I want you to borrow, borrow vessels abroad of all thy neighbors. And you know your neighbor's going to be nosy. Come on now, help me out. All right, if y'all don't help me out, guess what, we're going to stop right here. Help me out. You know your neighbors. Your neighbors are going to ask you, what you need them for? <laughs> yeah, what you, what you got going on? What you, your neighbors going to ask you. All right? Don't your friends ask you now? Why you go to church all the time? Because I serve God. Why don't you go? They're not going to tell you, well, I serve the devil. They can always tell you, well, I, I, I'm, I'm not ready for that yet. So which that means that you're always ready for hell. All right? Because if you ain't ready for God, you're ready for hell. That's, that's the whole deal. There's no in-between. And don't believe on purgatory. Because there is no such thing as purgatory. All right? Oh, somebody going, please get back to that. I don't want to hear nothing but no hell. You need to. What kind of conviction do you have in your heart if you don't understand that there's two places that man is assigned to be, all right? One with the Lord because he owns heaven and earth, all right? And one with the devil because he doesn't own anything, all right? So if I'm not with the Lord who owns everything, I have no place to stand. All right. The Lord showed me this before we even went into ministry when I used to work for the Southland Corporation and I used to come home and pray in the spirit all the time. And then one day I told him, I said, listen, you know, because I used to work with these guys that were Jehovah's Witnesses and these guys who were Scientologists and all, kind, all kinds of people in the, in the work field out there, you know, and they always had all these questions. And I asked him, I said, show me what hell looks like. And I remember the day that I laid down on the, on the, on the cross the bed in our, in our bedroom and all of a sudden, God took me there, and he showed me how, how these pits are there, and people are inside these fiery pits. They are inside these things. And he showed me, this, as far as you could see, people inside this place. And then he showed me this. He said, after he showed me that, then he took me out. And all these people were standing in a line out in the glory, just standing out in the, in the sky like they were standing out in the universe. And I asked him, I said, what does that mean? And he says, they have no place. They don't belong to the earth because I gave earth to man and, and the earth is his mind. So as long as man is mine, man has a, a place to work and to live on the earth. But they have no place. And I was going like, whoa. So you can't tell me that you don't want to hear about hell. All right? Hearing about heaven is a great thing. You born again? You're born again? Yeah. You're born again? Yeah. And guess what? You enjoy a lot of things that other people ain't going to ever get to see. But if you're not born again, you've not given your life to Jesus Christ, and you're playing all these games about when somebody tell you, oh, we got this little group, oh, we got this little pool, oh, we got this little group, we meet over here, we do all this. Let me tell you something about a group. Ain't no salvation in a group. Salvation is in Jesus' name, and that is individual. If you, don't, if you don't get that, you ain't got nothing. And how many people are standing there that have no place to go except away from God's presence? Y'all want to get back to the story? See, I don't mind talking about salvation because I understand it. Without it, you ain't going to see God. All right? What's in your wallet? Do you have a card to say we can go through either gate you know, there are 12 gates. Do you have a card that says 12 gates on it? I'm going to go over here and talk to Nate a little bit. while y'all thinking on that one. Do you have a card, Nate, that says 12 gates? That means that there are 12 gates to glory. You can get in at any, any gate you want to. So you got to pass. It's called the easy, easy pass. <laughs> Woo. Let's get back to the story. 
He said, what do you, what can I do for you? Tell me what you have in the house. And she said, thine handmen have not anything in the house except the pot of oil. And he said, go and borrow vessels abroad of all thy neighbors, even empty vessels. Borrow not a few. These are the instructions, all right? These are the instructions. And when thou art come into thy house, shut the door upon thee and thy sons. They are the ones who caused the bondage, all right? So they have to be the ones who participate in their own deliverance. <laughs> and shall pour out into all those vessels, and thou shalt set aside that which is full. And so she went from him, and she shut the door upon her and her sons who brought the vessels to her, and she poured out. But something happened before this that happens with most of us when an instruction comes, all right? We analyze. He told me to go borrow all these vessels. And then he tells me to pour out what I have. Excuse me. This is her thinking before it actually happened. He told me to borrow all these vessels. And then I got one little pot of oil. The oil versus the vessel? That ain't gonna add up. Because the vessel is bigger than my pot of oil. See, when you analyze an instruction from God, you're trying to figure out, which God already knows, all right, if I'm going to do what I want to do versus what God tells me to do. See, and when you do what you want to do, you've already told God that you've decided what's best for you, all right? Now, she asked the man, and the man told her what to do, but she's trying to figure out before is this going to work? Because all I have is one little pot. And he told me to get a whole lot of pots. And if I start pouring out, my little bit ain't going to fill the first pot. See, you're analyzing what the end's going to be. Before you even follow the instruction, you're trying to get your own answer. I can see this lady when her sons bought that pot of oil in there. Now, wouldn't it be something today if this oil just kept on pouring? You guys would just, you guys would just get up and just fall out, wouldn't you? And some of you wouldn't even move you because you'd be going like, Myrtle, look at that. I never saw anything like that all my days. <laughs> it says she poured out. And this one, my man. And this one got full. And it says that she set it aside, and then she kept on pouring because the oil didn't stop. See, she didn't do this and pull it back up. She just had it over, and it just kept on pouring. And when that one got full, guess what? Son moved it. She put it in another pot. But all she had was that little teeny bit. All right? But, but guess what? She's pouring out. And she's pouring out, and she's pouring out. And when this one got full, and that 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 one got full, the son finally said, there ain't no more pots. And when he said, there ain't no more pots, the oil stopped. See, because your, your confession got a whole lot to do with how God runs things. We come back to the question in the first lesson. Can you expect God to bring your supply whole here out of such a little bit? See, all she had was a little bit. Could she expect God to do all of that out of just that little bit? See, when you, you go out and you see somebody standing on the corner of the street, God says, you know, buy lunch for them. Well, Lord, all I got is $20 left. Like he didn't know. <laughs> right. 
you know, the instruction is buy lunch for them because you don't know who you're meeting. Now, I'm hearing a lot of stories about rich people that are dressing themselves up like they're poor. And they're sitting on the side of the streets, they're on the side of the highways and things, and they're, and they're, they're, they're sitting there going like, who really cares about somebody else? That they would stop and check me out. And, and God tell you, I'll go over there and buy somebody lunch, and you go like, I ain't got time to buy them lunch, I'm on my way to work. Like you really want to go where you work. <laughs> like you really in a hurry to get there, right? Come on now, talk. let's be real. Let's be real with yourself. You ain't in no rush to get there because if you were, you'd have got up an hour early and got there an hour early. You just barely want to get there on time because that's the only place you got to work right now. And guess what? You want to spend the least amount of time as you can there. See, you, you're playing games with yourself. But the Lord knows that the person is standing there that's dressed up like he's homeless. He's looking for somebody to give his business to. But you wouldn't expect God's resources to come out of somebody like that. See, you wouldn't expect God's resources to come out of somebody that you get born again. Well, I, don't, I ain't got time to talk to them about the Lord. But yet they're the one who owns all of the factories down there in Florida. But you ain't got time to talk to them because you don't know and understand that the wealth of the sinner is later for the just. And God is saying, if you go talk to them, maybe I'll open up some of that that'll come into my kingdom. But because you don't, because you don't expect that blessing or resource to come out of that place or that person, you don't do nothing. You analyze the situation. This lady had to analyze the situation. She'd have still been poor. But when you read the bottom of the story, it says she got so happy she found the man of God again. And look what happened. And it came to pass when all the vessels were full that she said unto her son, hey, listen, bring me another one, boy. Quick. There was not another vessel. And he said, there's no more. And all stayed. And then she came and told the man of God. And she said, he said, go sell the oil. Who are you going to sell it to? Not the poor. Because if you sell it to the poor, you ain't going to get what you need to get your sons out of debt. Go and sell the oil to people that can afford it to give you what you have valued your life to get it from. Oh, mercy, let me say something about this. See, you devalue yourself as a Christian. You, you talk to everybody. Everybody's got something and whatever. I don't do that. There are people that qualify for my wisdom. I don't go around telling everybody everything. There are people that qualify for my time. Because God has invested so much in me. Well, he, he already told us, don't throw your pearls before. Because all they're going to do is take your wisdom and go, oh, that man's crazy. But you just told them how to fix their marriage. Oh, that man is crazy. You go do that. No, why, why are you going to do that when he ain't going to listen to you in the first place? And you have to have a discerning heart to know. He ain't going to listen to me, so why am I? No, you, I don't even want you to talk to my hand because my hand ain't going to give you no attention. See, you got to have the knowledge as a believer that Jesus hung on that cross for you. That wasn't a five and dime buy. That was an eternal purchase with his own blood for us to have a life that's above the ordinary. And so when you get up in the mornings, the first address should be him. When you lay down at night, you should say, I know you're going to keep me. And if, you, and if I don't wake up in the morning, I know I'm going to be with you. So you're gonna, it's going to be a sunrise in glory. You, you have to have this attitude that wherever you are, that you and God are walking together. You would not treat God the way you treat your friends. Regardless of how close they are to you. God always gets priority. Some of your friends, you ignore them and you say, wait, I got to do this, whatever. But with God, you don't do that. He has priority. Is he getting to you? Does God make you antsy when you listen to him? <laughs> he make your flesh move, don't he? He make you go like, oh, man, I can't, I can't. Your flesh don't want to hear about God. Not at all. Because it knows that sin has been condemned in the flesh. 
So it knows that when it hears about God, it has already been condemned. God ain't given your flesh no life. Only when you're a believer and through the resurrection will you come back. But not your flesh. Your flesh is going to get ate up by the worms. What a meal. What a meal. Let's talk about that for a moment. What a meal that the worms in the earth are going to have on your condemned flesh. Or what a meal the worms in hell are going to have on your condemned flesh. See, you won't hear no preachers talking about this a whole lot because everybody wants everybody to be happy with them. Be happy with me, please. Now, let me tell you something. Your natural body is going to face when you are buried. Sin has been condemned in the flesh. Thank God you're going to be with Jesus. But your body is going back to the dust. All right? And even in that, if you're lost, not only does your natural body go back by the worms, but the Bible teaches us first the natural, then the spiritual. Then your spiritual body, as it says, is going to be laying in worms that they don't have no diet. They don't get full. Well, it gets quiet in here today, right? We're not in a Catholic church. Come on here. Somebody say hallelujah. Hallelujah. See, when you're not fearful of God, you can trust God. And see, and I know and understand that people that are not born again, they don't like to hear stuff like this. They like to hear, oh, tell me how nice it is and how everybody loves me and whatever. Well, I want you to know this first. Before you got here, God loved you. And he proved it by giving his own son on the cross. All right? That's price enough. He don't have to come back and tell me every day he loves me. That's love enough to let me know that I don't have to live the way that I think I want to live. And I see so many of our kids choosing all these ways that the world is bringing them and telling them you can live for yourself and you can be your own God. A child left to himself is like your body left to itself. If you leave your body to itself, what will your body do? It'll go after every craving. It'll go after everything that's there because there is no parenthood on your body. Well, it's the same thing with the child. If you leave a child to themselves and there's no parenthood on that child, that child will believe and do everything that it possibly wants to do because it's taking in evolved knowledge. That's evolved humanistic knowledge. And evolved humanistic knowledge only comes through the times and the experiences that men have. But our faith goes beyond that. This is why we can believe for healing when the body says it's sick. This is why we can believe for things here because the body is saying, or people are saying, no, you got to stay back there. We can believe, no, we can go forward because God has given us his faith, which is his trust and promise to us that we can have better, all right? And so you got you to teach your kids, listen, this is the way you go. Most parents have no authority over their children today. You've seen some of them in the store. I don't know why I'm talking about kids right now, but you've seen some of them in the store and the way they speak to their, to their parents. You know, 20 years ago, I'll go back to me because if I say something to you guys, you might get mad. But if I had said something, raised my voice at my mom, my, my, this side would have been my right side because she would have slapped me no matter where I was because I would be disrespecting her parenthood over me. See, your children are you going into your future, all right? Now, I want you to get this. I want all of you to get this. You are your child going into the natural world in the future. You are your spiritual children going into their future, okay? So... When I live and I, and I bring my kids up, and I did, he, he, my man, then that's me in the natural going on generation after generation. Well, it's the same thing when I bring my child up and I get my children saved. <laughs> that's me 
going on into an eternal life with the Lord over and over and over and over and over. And this is why God told Abraham, it's not enough for you to have a son, but I've called you to be a father of nations because you will continue to go on. All right? And so every parent has got to understand that. Your child is going on and they're going to represent you in the years to come. But when they're born again, they're going to represent Jesus in you throughout eternity. Well, I can't say nothing to my child because they all did this. They just buck up. Well, let them buck. Give them a horse. You know, buy them a cow or something. Let them buck all they want. Then when they get tired, then, you know, you just set them down and say, okay, you tired of bucking? <laughs> you, can, you can solve problems. Come on, go with me to John chapter 2, then I'm going to let you guys go home. Maybe. See, when we walk this eternal, supernatural life, I have to expect God to do things beyond my natural comprehension. See, I have to expect that. I have to be the one. You, don't you know you're your own significant prophet when it comes to spiritual things? You're the one who has to say what God says over you. If you, if you, why are, we, why are, you, why are you guys trying to find, <laughs> trying to find, trying to find John chapter 2? Come on, go with me to Jeremiah chapter 1. Come on, hold it. Come on now. Let me tell you. See, see, this is why God gave us this house. He didn't give, he did not give this house as a gift for people to come and just, you know, well, I want to be me and I want to be me. Well, that was, that was somebody else that sang that song. You go sing your own song. But here we're going to sing to the Lord. You know, you go sing your own song. There's nothing wrong with you singing your own song. Go sing your song. I tell people all the time, do you want to be a Muslim? Go on to be a Muslim. Be the best one you can be. If you want to be this and be that, go be the best one you're going to be. But as for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. You go, I'm not, I'm not against you if that's what you want to do. Go do it. You know, sit down, chill out, be whoever you want to be. But there's only one name given under heaven whereby men might be saved. And it ain't Muhammad. It ain't Joseph Smith. It ain't none of these old people that got all these little groups following them running. It ain't none of us. It's the name of Jesus. And if you don't know his name, you better find out real quick. In Jeremiah chapter 1. Y'all there? Somebody say amen real quick. Y'all didn't say real quick. Say amen real quick. <laughs> All right. Here we go. Check this out. Most people stop right here. Then the word, beginning verse 4. Then the word of the Lord came unto me saying, before I formed thee in the womb, before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee. This is in the book of days. Psalms 139, I'll tell you about the book of days. God knew us before we got here. He says, before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee, and before thou camest forth out of the womb, I sanctified thee. And I ordained thee a prophet unto the nations. Then said I, oh, Lord God, behold, I cannot speak, for I'm a child. But the Lord said unto me, say not, I'm a child. Uh, in other words, he knows you better than you know yourself. All right? That's why you can't be saying you're sick when you're talking about, well, by his stripes I'm healed. That's his word for you. So you can't be saying I'm sick because he's saying, no, by my son's stripes you're healed. He says this. Listen, listen, listen now. Catch this. But the Lord said unto me, say not, I'm a child, for thou shalt go to all that I shall send thee, and whatsoever I command thee, thou shalt speak. Be not afraid of thy faces, for I am with thee to deliver thee, saith the Lord. And then the Lord put forth his hand. And he touched my mouth. Behold, I have put my words in your mouth. He says, see, I have this day set thee over nations and over kingdoms to root out, to pull down, to destroy, to throw down, to build up, and to plant. In other words, when God's word is in your mouth, God has given you the power to take care of these things. So this is why you got to say what you got to say and, and, and just say what you got to say. <laughs> Are you guys with me? Because he put his word in your mouth so that you could pull down and root up and tear up and plant and make things happen and change things. Now come on, go with me to John chapter 2. Huh. I don't know what I'm going to do. I know what you need to do. Give your life to Jesus, then he'll start telling you some things. 
Well, I'm confused. That's fear. And fear ain't got no love in it. Well, help me. I will. If you ask. If you ask the Lord, he'll help you. Well, how can I ask him? Open up your mouth. Tell him right now, Jesus, come into my heart. And whatever unbelief I have, help my unbelief. That's all you got to do. Stop playing those old humanistic games. Well, we dress up like this. Who's we'll saying Halloween? This is the kingdom of Almighty God. We walk in robes of righteousness. Hmm? My face don't look like something that I don't know what it looks like. <laughs> Woo wee. Halloween. All Hallows Day. John chapter 2. In the third day, there was a marriage in Canaan of Galilee. And the mother of Jesus was there. This is a Tuesday. Third day. This Tuesday was always a thing with them about having weddings. And both Jesus was calling his disciples to the marriage. And when they wanted wine, what do they want? Wine. Come on now, what do they want? Wine. They want wine, right? Oh, y'all got to get this one. They wanted wine. Come on now, come on, come on, come on. They wanted wine, just like you want what you want. All right? They wanted wine. The mother of Jesus said unto him, they have no wine, Jesus. Jesus said unto her, woman, what do I, what, what have I to do with thee? Mine hour is not yet come. All right? Now, here's a, a leadership lesson in this, that there are other people that can move you into your place. <laughs> his mother said unto, his serv unto the servants, showing that the mother had some authority with the servants. Because she couldn't just tell servants anywhere what to do when they do it. See, see, Mary had some authority. Somebody said, sounds like me. See, see, Mary had some authority even when she wasn't at home because she was known. That's why she was invited to the wedding. His mother said unto the servants, whatsoever he saith unto you, do it. Whatever he say to you, do it. These are instructions. Don't analyze it. Don't sit there and try to figure out how this is going to happen and that's going to happen. When God gives you an instruction, just do what he said to do. Will you have questions? Oh, yes, you will. Don't you ever think that faith is without questions? Abraham had them. You're going to have them. All right? Questions. Okay? But those questions can never become a place where I just, I'm just not going to do what God told me to do. See, God knows how we're framed. He knows we're going to have questions. There were set six water pots of stone after the manner of the purifying of the Jews containing two or three firkins. This is like 20, 30 gallons a piece. That's a lot of wine. Wow, he could have started a business. He could have pulled over in the parking lot over there and everybody would have said, ABC stole Jesus and he'd have been over there buying, buying wine on Sundays. <laughs> Jesus said unto them, Fill the water pots with water. Say what? We need wine. Kevin, I want you to fill the water pots with water. You ain't going to do that because you're going to be looking at that pot and you're going to be going like the first thing in your mind is the scientific information that will come to you and say, it takes a while for water. <laughs> There's a process. See, we're analyzing. There's a process I know from my common sense, and common sense ain't common no more. There's a process that I know that you have to have water, you got to have some sugar, you got to have some fruit. My grandmother used to make wine. That's why I can tell y'all this, all right? <laughs> you got <laughs> you to gotta, you gotta have some yeast. I'm thinking back now because all the stuff she used to make me put in it. She probably laughing at her. Why are you talking about me there? All I'm saying is there, there are other ingredients other than water that has to go into a pot to make wine. Some of you drinkers know what I'm talking about. All right, I'll say some of you sippers. 
Because Christians don't drink, right? Y'all just sip. <laughs> well, there's nothing wrong with wine, a little wine for your stomach's sake. Well, are you sick? Or well, are you thirsty? <laughs> people, people use all kinds of analogies. He said unto them, fill the water pots with water. What? How are we going to get water in a matter of moments? Again, here's what we begin with today. God will bring you resources from unexpected places. Unexpected. These guys weren't expecting this to be no wine. We just pouring in water. No more than you poured in eggs, you know, in your pan this morning. And you gonna believe when you get back that guess what? Well, when you first did it, that I'm gonna have me an omelet and everything's gonna be fine, and I'm gonna be full when I go to church, and you ain't touch nothing. And let me tell you something. There's a process, naturally, but with God, as with the stone. As with the oil, all right? God can bring you what you need out of unexpected resources. And you gotta have that kind of mentality in these days because everybody's talking shortage out there. there ain't no shortage to God. And you gotta know that. It says, He said unto them, it says, they filled the, them to the brim. I can imagine those servants looking at that water, shaking their heads like, Boy, this is embarrassing. This is absolutely embarrassing. They need wine, and Jesus told us. He, he didn't tell us go to the store the next town real quick. He told us to pour water. In fact, 30 gallons of water. Huh. Here's the next command. This is when you're walking in the supernatural. Go, I hope y'all get this. This is when you begin to walk in the supernatural. It says, he said unto them, draw out now and bear unto the governor of the feast. This is when you're walking in the supernatural, when you will take the instruction no matter how senseless it might be to you and you'll follow it. That's walking in the supernatural. See? When, I, when I, I'm, I'm looking at the water and I'm, I'm, I'm dipping it out and I'm pouring it in and all I see is water. Because he told me to draw out. But then he says, now I want you to carry it to the man up there. And when they're walking to the man, the governor of the feast, between the time they pulled out and the time they got to him, the supernatural took place. The supernatural took place. By the time that, because I know they were looking at it and they're going like, we just poured this in and it's water. Now he's telling us to draw it out and it's still water. When is it going to become wine? When you start taking the steps. It becomes a supernatural walk when you start making some action to what you've been instructed to instead of sitting there trying to analyze, this is still water. It's still water. And it says that when the ruler of the feast tasted the water that was made wine. When was it made wine? When they walked with the water. When they took the steps of faith, carrying it to where it should be, it says the water turned to wine. And the man at the other end, he had never recognized it as water. He had never seen it before. His only, his only, his only report was that it was wine. When the ruler of the feast had tasted the water that was made wine, he knew not whence it was, but the servants knew because <laughs> they had drawn the water. The governor of the feast called the bridegroom and he said, and this is what I love when things give glory to God. Every man at the beginning do set forth good wine and when men have well drunk, then they which is that which is worse, but thou has kept the good wine until now. Sounds like Jesus to me. Always good at the end, boy. 
Always good at the end. Always good. Somebody say always. always. Always good at the end. And that's why he tells us I'm working out all things together for your good. You just got to endure. Stop being all, you know, analytic, analytic, analytical. Well, I just want to know. You don't need to know. What you need to know is the end of the promise is waiting on you. I'm after the benefit. I'm not after the power that's going to change it because that's not mine. I don't possess that. God possesses that. And so when we walk in the supernatural walk, I'm expecting all kinds of things to happen for you guys. Amen. The beginning of the year when I told you guys that God's restoring, people started getting raises, they started getting promotions, all the way up to 50-some thousand dollar raise. That is, and then somebody told me this morning they got a $7,500 raise yesterday. I mean, you guys got $18,000 raise, you got 20 some thousand dollar raise. Everybody was coming telling me, I was going, like, man, we're going to write a book on this thing. And now I'm telling you, there are unexpected resources that are going to open up for you guys. Things that you never even thought were going to open up for you guys. Well, I got one, amen. Can I get two? I got two. I got two. Can I get three? Can I get three? Can I get three? How about four? How about four? How about four? How about five? How about ten? Ten, ten. Can I get ten? Sold to ten, which means redemption. Sold to ten. Come on, son, Nate. That's my newest son. That's my oldest son. That's my natural spiritual son. And I got some other sons all in between. Not brothers. Notice I said sons. Because everybody in the church don't become sons. Everybody don't become daughters. We all come, females and males. But sometimes we grow into just being brothers. Sometimes we grow into being sons. Depends on your heart attitude. How's my heart? What's my connection? What am I storing myself up for, for my future? What's the implant of my heart? Is it steady? Is it trusting? Do I hear? Do I follow? See, we got a lot to do, a lot to learn. We got 1,680 more people coming in this house. And you guys got to be ready. And it ain't for you that don't want to. I'm not talking to you. I don't ever talk to people that don't want to listen to me. I talk to those who want to listen. And those who listen and hear, you hear more. See, I want you to hear when you're away. And God's telling you, this is something I gave. I want you to have it in your mouth so that you can pull down, so you can root up, so you can plant, so you can build. That's why I gave you guys that confession. See? That's why we say, that's why the signs are out there. That's why it's going to be more and more all over the place. After a while, every time somebody see you, they're going to think 1,680 more, you know. That's what they're going to do. Why? Because he said to write it down so that he that read it may run with it. Where are they going to run? They're going to tell somebody else. What are they going to do? They're going to tell somebody else. Then they, eventually they're going to tell somebody, they're going to say, you know, that sounds like me. See, the word gets around. Why? Because you can't stop the word. When truth comes, you can't stop it. You can stop all, all, all other kinds of conversations. You know, but you can't stop truth. And this is what we've always been about. And I tell you today, if you're in this house, I'm going to do this before Pastor Milton come, my man. Before he comes and give these invitations. If you're here this morning and there's any demonic grip in your life, I don't care what it is. You've been smoking and want to get rid of nicotine. Well, you got to get rid of the demon that's got your tongue tied first. I smacked a young man on his tongue as I smacked my brother many years ago on his tongue. And uh, the other day, the young man was here in town visiting his mother-in-law. Last Sunday, last Sunday. And uh, his, his wife said something funny. Pastor Rock smacked him on his tongue years ago. I wish he'd smack him on his head. <laughs> I, was, I, was going, I was going like, sometimes people need to be smacked on the head. Because there are all kinds of things that oppress you. And a lot of times people don't think that there's, well, I'm a Christian now. I don't have, the enemy's not influencing me. Yes, he is. When you don't believe God, he's influencing you. When you doubt God, he's influencing you. When you say that, well, I just don't believe God. Who do you think is influencing you to say that they don't, you don't believe in God? The Bible says that even the, the one that's telling you not to believe in God believes in God. It says the devils believe and tremble. So they believe in God. They know about it, okay? 
but yet they deceive people into thinking that ain't no God. Isn't that something? <laughs> if you're here this morning, you want to be free. Doesn't matter. You know, I told you this morning, I'm expecting God. The power of God's presence to unleash himself against his enemies that might be working against you or controlling you. And if you're here this morning, I'd love to speak to it and tell it to get out. I'd love to speak to it and tell it to get its hands off of you because I have that authority to do so, to tell it to go. And if necessary, go to the abyss. But you're going to leave this house that you think you own. God gave us that authority. And if you're a believer, you should be walking in it every day. It's the fruit of the Spirit that's living inside of you, that's warning everybody to be well, that it comes into contact with. So, if that's you this morning, I'll give you 30 seconds to get yourself up here. And if not, guess what? Pastor Milton's going to come. And come right on, sir. Stand over here. Come on over here. Anybody else? Things that are going on, you just can't get rid of it. You just can't. You know, it's like, oh, no, no. I've been fighting. I've been scratching. I can't get rid of this nicotine problem. I can't get rid of this drinking thing. I can't get rid of this. I need you to turn around and face the, face the altar there because that's where my daddy is. I, I just try. You know, it's always like this time of the year, this is going on. I thought this time of the year is supposed to be blessed for, for you. If, if something's going on this time of the year, you know that something's wrong because every day is this is the day that the Lord has made. It shouldn't be something going on that's causing this or causing that, you know? Iniquitous patterns, you know? It, you know, I, I live like this. My daddy lived like this. My mama lived like this. All my brothers and sisters live like this. We all live like this, you know? And you just think that just because it's in your generation, now it's just, it's just the way you're supposed to live? But, but that ain't what the Bible says, you know? And you don't have to bite your nails because I'm talking. You need to reach in and pull your heart out. Hand it to Jesus. Because he's the one. He holds everything. So you ready to give some invitations while I'm over here? Come on. Get him, mommy. Hallelujah. Well, for those of you that are watching us through uh, live stream, those of you that are here, here in the house today, we thank God for his word that he's given today through Apostle Rock. I know that you've been listening. You've been hearing what the Lord has been speaking to you as he's been searching your heart and he's been taking inventory of what's going on in your life. So I ask you right now, as the Lord is speaking to you, what is he saying to you? What is he saying to you about where you are in life? How is your relationship with him? Is he nudging at your heart concerning salvation right now? And if, if he is doing so, I want to extend the invitation to you to invite the Lord Jesus into your heart. As you heard Apostle Rock say here earlier, there is not any other name that is given under heaven whereby men may be saved. They can gather here in that name and they can gather over there in that name, but there's only one name under heaven and his name is Jesus, Yeshua. And so if that's you out there today, you know that God is tugging at the strings of your heart right now and you want to invite him in. I want to lead you in a prayer where you can receive salvation in your life today by permission, by your words, you will invite the Lord Jesus in. So say these words after me. If that's you here in this place, if that's you out there, say, so dear Lord Jesus, I come to you today. I come as a sinner needing a savior. I ask you, to forgive me of the 
the sins that I've committed against you. And I invite you into my life to be my Lord and to be my Savior. I believe that you died on the cross for my sins and that you were also raised from the dead that I also would be raised up with you. So I receive you now. I thank you for forgiving me and I thank you for saving me this day. I make you the Lord of my life. In Jesus' name. If you prayed that prayer, God bless you. Welcome to God's eternal forever family. And so if you're out there watching us through live stream and you prayed this, I ask you to uh, let us know on our website, fccwoc.org. Let us know that you prayed this prayer so that we may continue to encourage you, strengthen you by the word of God. Uh, Jesus spent three to three and a half years discipling men and women so that they would be able to walk with him. And even when he left, they would be able to carry on in the work. And so discipleship is a very important part of our lives that God has given us. And we want to continue to pour God's word into your life that you may grow in this new walk with him. So if that's you out there, please let us know. Uh, we have many different resources, ways to connect with you so that God's word will strengthen your life continuously. Uh, check us out on Facebook, uh, YouTube, look up FCCWO Church, wherever um, you go to for uh, social media, you can find us. And uh, there are many resources where your life can continuously be blessed. If you're out there and you're here today and you're looking for a place to call your church home, so this invitation is extended to you, whether you're online or whether you're in person. Um, you're looking for a place where you can connect to, get plugged into the anointing of God, the power of God for your life, wherever it is that you may be across the globe. There are some 49 nations around the earth that, uh, that our ministry touches and impacts, and we know that you're a part of one of those places. Even here in the U.S., maybe you're some part of the, uh, uh, of the, the geographical U.S., we want you to be a part of what God is doing here. And, and so allow our ministry to even connect with you in a greater way in the community where you reside, where God's word will reach those that are around you and touch those that are around you. So if you're desiring to be a part of our ministry, maybe you're not in this uh, location where we are, um, there is online membership that you can subscribe to and we can uh, we will reach out to you and, and let you know what that means and what details that are provided for that and, and the special benefits that come from being a member of this ministry. So God bless you. We look forward to continue to have the opportunity to share God's word with you in your life every day. Check out Apostle Rock on Facebook on The Daily Bread as it comes to you live each morning. Um, but God bless you. We call you blessed of the Most High God. And we pray that you have a great week this week. So we look forward to seeing you next time. Amen.